As, as all of you know, this school was named uh, in honor of uh, Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson was the, the, the individual who created Princeton's first informal motto, which is Princeton in the nation's service. And I cannot imagine a speaker that would have pleased him more uh, to speak here at the school uh, uh, in this lecture on science policy than today's speaker, Harold Barnes, who is one of our nation's most preeminent scientists, uh, but also a great, great public servant. Uh, actually, Harold did not begin life as a scientist. He began life as an English scholar. And I have to say personally that this um, has greatly benefited uh, myself as his co-author because I think we have never dangled a participle <laughs> in any paper that we have ever published together. Never used impact as a verb. <laughs> never used impact as a verb. Um, but it was not long after he graduated uh, with a degree in English uh, from Amherst College that Harold saw the light and realized that he wanted to spend his life in medicine. Uh, he went to Columbia University School of Medicine, and then uh, after a, a, a short fellowship at the NIH, went out to the University of California, San Francisco, where he, together with his mentor, uh, Michael Bishop, did simply groundbreaking work in cancer research. Um, what he and my uh, identified was the first um, genes that were known to cause cancer. And it simply revolutionized the field of cancer research. It opened up whole new ways of thinking about it, and, and this extraordinary work was honored with the Nobel Prize in 1989 to Harold and mine. In 1993, while he was a a uh, distinguished professor at UCSF, minding his own business, running a very successful laboratory. He uh, uh, got the call from uh, Bill Clinton in the White House and agreed to come to Washington and to be the director of the National Institutes of Health, which he did from 1993 to 1999. And I would say his tenure at the NIH uh, during that decade was what many of us see as the golden age of uh, biomedical science. Not only did Harold appoint extraordinary people to run the various institutes of the NIH, but he put uh, a, a very major emphasis on the role that the NIH could play in global health, and you're going to hear about some of that today in his lecture. Uh, he had uh, a challenging time during those years when stem cells and HIV and uh, cloning and <coughs> Uh, President Shapiro, who is here with us today, uh, was uh, working with uh, Harold Barmas at the time on those issues as head of the Bioethics Commission in Washington. Um, but it was a time when I think I can safely say that we scientists felt that we had a champion in Washington who was really uh, directing the nation's biomedical research enterprise in a way that um, we thought was uh, just simply extraordinary. Uh, he left uh, the NIH in, and uh, moved to New York City, where he was president of Memorial Sloan Kettering, for a decade. Uh, and there, once again, he had a major impact on that institution, uh, both in terms of uh, the kind of support he gave to both basic and translational research, as well as expanding the capacity of that institution to make groundbreaking discoveries in cancer research and in treatment. And then he missed the fun of living in Washington, D.C. and returned uh, there in 2010 to be the director of the National Cancer Institute. And once again in that role, he championed uh, the role that the, this federal agency could play in not just the health of this country, but uh, the health of people all around the world. And um, after uh, five just extraordinary years at, at the NCI, he uh, then returned once again to New York City and is now um, the Lewis Thomas Professor at the Cornell Weill Medical School in New York City. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Harold Barnes.
I was enjoying that a lot. <laughs> and sorry it couldn't go on longer, Shirley. <laughs> Your memory is terrific. Um, so it's a great treat to be here, and I've had a great time today meeting with a lot of your students. I'm very glad this uh, lecture is named for my friend Gil Oman, whom I've known for 50 years since we were both uh, avoiding the Vietnam War by working at the NIH and also learning something in the bargain. Um, as you may have gathered from some of the things Shirley said, um, I've operated for the last 50 years or so on the premise that uh, science is a public good and that uh, it's a public good that's in equitably distributed at the moment, but should be uh, used much more widely to improve the status of our species. And um, I've spent a certain amount of time, in addition to what I've done in the laboratory or running American institutions, to uh, try to um, confront the possibility of using science to improve health around the world. Um, this has not always been part of my, uh, of, of my program. And I want to give you a little bit of a, of a brief history of how my engagement with, um, with internationalization of science occurred. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a number of instances I've been involved with in which some of the difficulties of establishing uh, international relationships uh, in the pursuit of science, especially science in my own area where um, it becomes applied to the health of people living, especially in developing countries. Um, and uh, I want to talk about the conditions that, that promote the successful use of science to improve uh, the lives of others. Uh, some of us are born lucky. We end up in the Woodrow Wilson School. Or we um, work in these, in these uh, wonderful establishments with money to support our research. But a lot of people in the world, the vast majority, have much less happy um, situations. And uh, my own view is that one of the things we can do as scientists is try to improve the status of people living in this crowded and threatened world. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about personal history, a little bit about uh, um, the, the things that need to be done to try to achieve some of these lofty goals. And I'll give you some direct real life experiences with a lot of illustrations that I hope are entertaining. Um, Another thing that's auspicious about this invitation to come here right now is that I am rethinking some of the things that uh, happened to me in this science diplomacy, international um, science arena. Um, and I'm about to leave in about 10 days to go to Dakar for the celebration of the 20th anniversary of something called the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria, which arose uh, as a result of some discussions that were conducted when I was director of NIH about the participation of people who had been trained um, in the US but came from Africa uh, in the international life of science. And that led to a, a meeting that was co-hosted. Uh, well, the, the host was, uh, uh, were officials from, uh, from Senegal, but uh, the meeting was organized by me and by the director. Can we have the lights down? I've got a lot of pretty slides, and we're not going to see them very well. We can't get the lights down here in the front. Is that possible? Um, yes. Hmm? You're going to have to find somewhere to find Oh, OK. I don't know how visible that is. That's not too bad. Um, anyway, um, about to head for, um, for this uh, event to celebrate uh, the founding of the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria, which is an active organization that brings together people, especially in Africa, who work on malaria and uh, um, to promote um, uh, better educational programs, uh, share reagents and, and, uh, and, and results, and uh, in many ways promote uh, the, the um, use of new advances in research to uh, improve prevention and treatment of malaria. Now, I think it's worth saying a couple of things at the outset about science and diplomacy uh, writ broadly. Um, I feel strongly about these uh, general principles, and I think I, I, before I get into specific examples of some of the things that I've, I've observed, um, I'd like to stress uh, some of the things that I think are important underpinnings for any understanding of, of how we do science across national borders. First of all, as I think this is the truth universally acknowledged that science is just inherently an international event. If you discover something, 
it's not just true in America, it's true in Europe, it's true in Africa, uh, that this discovery in science is frequently done through collaboration. Collaboration is usually, not always, but usually welcome. Uh, sometimes it's necessary, and if you want to study malaria, you really have to be in the malaria zone. Um, that, as I mentioned earlier, the world is not homogeneous with respect to, to resources and training and um, a national commitment to science. It is, I think, more homogeneous than we often realize with respect to talent, um, but we have to overcome some of these uh, difficulties that are engendered by uh, national wealth and uh, productivity and history and, and national um, uh, tranquility uh, to try to make the world an, e an evener playing field. Um, science serves a lot of universal desires, um, security, health, uh, energy, um, other things that uh, we hold in common about perpetuation of uh, the, the health of the, of the globe. Um, and uh, we need to recognize that international science is often needed to, to pursue those goals. And then um, it is a truism that, uh, that, that um, there are ways in which we can improve the, what the science we do by working internationally uh, and uh, by providing foreign assistance so that those who are more fortunate are able to help those who are less fortunate. Now, um, those are goals and aspirations. Um, doing international science is not always easy. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but what makes it feasible? I think it's another set of questions that worth asking at the outset. Um, one is that uh, you need to have commitments to actually carrying out foreign assistance. Many people think that our country has always been uh, extremely generous in foreign assistance. That's not true. We ranked quite low on the scale of uh, countries that provide a fraction of their, of, of their um, uh, national uh, economy to, uh, to foreign assistance in medicine or other things, uh, and that has improved. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, to allow science diplomacy to work, you have to have partners who are, have political stability. You can't put scientific effort into a country that's, uh, that is uh, uh, jarred by, uh, by internal conflict and uh, not interested in working with uh, a partner such as the US. Uh, one needs programs that have to be carefully designed to foster collaboration. Um, uh, there have to be local resources that, uh, um, that include things that might be provided, like the creation of science centers and helping to train people to, to carry out the work. Um, and, uh, uh, and we also need to have an international infrastructure for doing science that, that fosters communication of results uh, and allows, uh, uh, allows uh, exchanges of personnel, and that kind of uh, infrastructure is important, and I'll mention that in the context primarily of, of publication. Um, I need to make one thing clear at the outset. I, I am a basic biomedical researcher. Um, uh, sometimes I say I do things in the global health arena. Well, is there a distinction between these two areas? Well, yes. Um, the definitions are somewhat different. Um, for want of a better set of, uh, of uh, indications of boundaries. Let me just say that, that I see biomedical research, or biomedical science is consisting of a whole variety of, of approaches to research, basic biological research, clinical research, so-called so translational research in which fundamentals of biology are brought to bear on clinical problems, uh, operational research, behavioral research, all designed to learn how biological systems work and to think about how we can improve public health uh, by, uh, by making use of those discovered principles. On the other hand, global health has more to do with efforts to treat and prevent disease everywhere in the world, but especially focused on, on uh, health in poor countries. Uh, it involves not just uh, carrying out uh, the precepts of, of medical science, but also uh, building uh, healthcare programs uh, and uh, addressing deficiencies in, in, in the provision of either preventive or, or, or uh, therapeutic services. Um, and uh, it is built on the knowledge that biomedical science creates, um, but it tends to be, as a term, 
uh, uh, referring to uh, what goes on in the developing world and has traditionally been focused more on infectious diseases, malaria, AIDS, tuberculosis, than in some of the areas I'll be mentioning today that, uh, that uh, include um, chronic non-communicable diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and so forth. So let me just say a couple of things about my own personal history here. I went to medical school um, as an uncertain idealist. I thought medical school opened doors to lots of occupations, lots of ways of living. One thing I wanted to try before I finished medical school was working in a poor country, and I went off to uh, the Clara Swain Mission Hospital in <coughs> Uttar Pradesh, India, in a town called Bareilly. Uh, this is a fairly modern picture. The place didn't look quite as kempt and, uh, and as polished as it does in these pictures, which were recently provided to me. Um, and uh, there I learned that I really wasn't at that stage well suited to life in a developing country uh, and that uh, my aspirations for um, proving, improving the, the, the scientific basis of medicine and the way in which medicine is practiced were not probably going to be satisfied in this setting. Um, so I really took a, a 30 year um, uh, sabbatical away from, uh, from um, any notion of what we then called tropical disease. Uh, and spent my life more or less, as you heard, uh, doing research and thinking about um, uh, its application to cancer for over 30 years. Uh, but when I was at the NIH, as I mentioned, I was exposed to some discussions about how we'd make better use of uh, the talents of African scientists who had been in the US or Europe and gone back to Africa, and whether we could get, bring them together uh, through um, uh, a common interest in malaria, which was being worked on uh, intensively at the NIH and many other places in the U.S. using U.S. dollars, uh, using NIH dollars, but um, and the result was this meeting in Dakar that led to the creation of the multilateral initiative, uh, with uh, at a time when there was a renewed interest on the part of uh, people around the world and the World Health Organization, many other places, uh, on, in malaria because we were suddenly looking at the genomes of the causative organism, plasmodium, the vector, the Anopheles mosquito, the human beings, the, the unfortunate host. Um, and um, there was a lot of advocacy being mobilized, and it was a good time uh, to try to bring together uh, a number of forces. And I'm going to come back to what this meant uh, with respect to one research center uh, in, in West Africa in just a moment. Um, but after um, my, my experience with malaria, I found myself engaged in some other uh, efforts to try to improve the atmosphere for doing, for doing global health. I participated with uh, a commission uh, put together by uh, Gru Rutland at the WHO, uh, led by Jeffrey Sachs, to try to explain the, the economic benefits of improving health through uh, uh, global health uh, enterprises. Uh, then I began doing some work for the for the Gates Foundation, um, uh, leading with a couple of colleagues, Rick Klausner and uh, Elias Serhone, uh, a, an effort called the Grand Challenges in Global Health, which uh, Bill Gates had rather cleverly designed on, on the model of David Hilbert, a mathematician uh, in Germany who had put together uh, 23 or 22 grand problems in mathematics to be solved, uh, and all of which, almost all of which did get solved over the next 70 years or so. And the idea was to make investments in, in basic research that, that uh, had relevance to major health problems in the developing world. Um, and this was an exciting uh, experience for me, watching um, very considerable amounts of money come from a private source to, uh, to scientists who had not been thinking very much about how their science might influence uh, the practice of health uh, control in, in, in uh, or disease control in, in, in poor countries. Um, we gave out a lot of money, a lot of good work was done, um, and further engaged me in the process. And then a few years later, um, I was asked by the institute, what was then called the Institute of Medicine, to prepare a new report on the um, U.S. investment in global health more broadly. And that brought me to the point at which I developed my best single credential for speaking at the Woodrow Wilson School, namely being a, a co-chair with the with the renowned um, multi-site ambassador Tom Pickering, uh, many of you may know, was the ambassador in nine or ten different countries, and uh, a remarkably uh, adept person in thinking through uh, problems in public policy, uh, to update a report that had been written about a decade earlier um, um, by by Barry Bloom and Harvey Feinberg, 
uh, in which they stated a, a principle that uh, I think continues to motivate many of us today, that we have a, America has a vital and direct stake in the health of people around the globe, and this interest derives from both America's long and enduring tradition of humanitarian concern and compelling uh, reasons of, uh, of enlightened self-interest. I think that is a combination of altruism and uh, practicality that, uh, that has served us uh, especially well in the last decade or so when um, the, the advances in our, in our in engagement with global health have been um, rapidly increasing. Um, so in our report at that time, while endorsing the basic principles, we also took note of the remarkable thing that had been done by President George W. Bush in starting a program called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, which well, most, most people don't know this, dramatically increased the amount of money that we were spending on global health around the world, uh, and uh, an enterprise that uh, is the subject of a whole other lecture that I don't have time to give today, and you don't have time to listen to, uh, that has dramatically changed the course of public health in Africa and a number of Asian countries as well uh, by confronting um, the AIDS epidemic with real dollars and, and a very carefully worked out plan for, uh, for preventing and treating HIV. Um, then, um, several years later, I had a chance to give a series of lectures in, in the UK to allow me to sort of rethink uh, my attitude to, toward uh, some of the experiences I had had up to then, um, and many of the, of the um, images that I'll show you today are from those lectures, uh, which um, can be accessed if, if any of you have any further desire to look at them in a, in a uh, journal that I think gets a little too, uh, doesn't get quite enough play in the world, and I want to draw your attention to it, especially as students who are thinking about um, a career in global health. That's a journal called uh, Science and Diplomacy, an open access journal uh, published by the American Academy of the Advancement of Science, sorry, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. Um, and uh, in that lecture, I discussed a, cu a couple of, or a series of lectures, I discussed a couple of, uh, of global health centers, um, that I will talk about now, and in addition, the PEPFAR program, which time does not permit dis discussing today. So I want to talk about three um, topics, each as briefly as I can, um, but um, uh, to illustrate some of the problems that, and opportunities that are inherent in efforts to use uh, internationalized science to advance public health. Uh, and the first is the develop development of research centers in, in um, in um, disadvantaged developing countries uh, by telling you a little bit about a malaria center in Bamako, Mali, and a little bit about a, a cancer center developed in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, then uh, I will tell you a, a bit about a specific program that we developed at the NCI during my recent tenure there, a center for global health to try to promote um, best practices and uh, more research on, on cancer through um, a program administered by the National Cancer Institute. And then finally, I want to talk about an infrastructural problem in science, that is, how do we get um, uh, scientific findings out to everybody so that people working in countries where journals are unaffordable or hard to obtain in a traditional manner uh, can be, um, uh, where these articles can be um, provided uh, quickly and freely uh, through the internet, uh, making a more level playing field for doing science in countries that are disadvantaged. So um, first, a few things about uh, the Malaria Center, um, which is a, a center that um, was founded in large part by a component of the NIH, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with WHO and the US uh, uh, agency for, um, uh, sorry, um, international development. USAID uh, in the early 1990s. Mali, for a few of you in the room who don't know about it, is a former French colony that uh, had a extraordinarily rich culture that peaked uh, in the 12th, 13th centuries. Um, don't have time to show you artifacts, but they're extremely beautiful. Um, uh, it achieved its independence in the early 1960s um, and uh, uh, developed a democratic government uh, in the early 90s. Uh, electing at that time a, a, a scientist, an archaeologist uh, trained uh, in, in Poland um, named Canary. 
um, but is descended into political instability in the early part of this decade and uh, has not really recovered. But let me say a few things about the center, which I consider to be remarkable for the way in which it was developed, the, the astounding uh, Malian scientists who worked there and been trained there, uh, and uh, as a, a source of incredible uh, pride in, in this uh, country, which is among the poorest in the world, uh, but nevertheless has a, a very highly esteemed center for malaria research and training. Um, it's obviously a source of national pride. Here's a picture of uh, Colin Powell and his wife visiting the malaria center uh, in, um, in the early aughts. Uh, it's a place of, uh, uh, that I was able to visit after that meeting in Dakar in, in, uh, in 1997, uh, and it's a very charming place here, um, shown eating uh, a um, traditional fish lunch with uh, uh, Lewis Miller, who um, we'll see a little bit more about in a moment, one of the leading malariologists in the U.S. working at the NIH with a number of uh, his colleagues at the Malaria Research Center. Um, one of the amazing things about the way this got going has to do with uh, the people who put an effort into creating this center and allowing collaboration uh, largely between uh, Malians and, and people from uh, and, um, the U.S. In the, um, in the early 1990s. Um, the prime mover here was a Frenchman named Philippe Branc, a microbiologist who, who spent uh, most of his career working as a faculty member at the University of Mali in Bamako, uh, who said that his sole goal in life was to have astounding scientists come from the Malian population and stay in Mali. Uh, working um, on important problems that uh, affected the population of Mali. Uh, uh, he engineered collaborations with other well-known malariologists around the world, including Mario Calusi, who was a, who was a population geneticist working on, on, um, on uh, insects, especially Anopheles, uh, shown here with a, a colleague from the NIH who's also a distinguished uh, uh, malaria researcher. And then uh, they were abetted by a good friend of mine, Tori Gadal, who was then running the Tropical Disease Unit at the World Health Organization labs in Geneva. And the three of them uh, helped to pave the way for getting some money for a couple of outstanding um, Malian students who had been working at the University of, of uh, Mali in Bamako. Uh, one, an entomologist, a student of insects named Yeye Torre, uh, who for many years was a co-director of the, of the lab in Bamako, now is at the Tropical Disease Center in Geneva. And I'm sorry this picture is a little dark, but uh, Ogo Duomo is a, um, is a physician uh, who was trained in Bamako and several other places, uh, who now is the director of that lab and has been for about uh, 20 years. Um, this would not have worked without a lot of American uh, involvement uh, from, from Louis, Louis Miller, who was uh, the, the fellow I was having lunch with in an earlier picture, who is a perhaps the most distinguished student of the malarial parasite in, in the U.S. Uh, his colleague, uh, Bob Watts from the uh, NIH, both of whom have been named in appreciation of their devotion to the center as chevaliers of the Mali nation. Uh, and the whole thing would not have worked without Dick Sakai, who was a, um, a, another um, scientist from NIH who came and remained for over 20 years at uh, the, the Malaria Research Center in, in Bamako. Uh, to help organize the way the, the laboratory functions. Uh, over the next 20 years, I don't want to bore you with all these details, but the, but the, the, the center thrived dramatically uh, with the growth of the center and a, a lot of other um, funding, not just from the NIH and NIAID, um, but also with the expansion of its research interest to other infectious diseases, some listed here, development of field stations for studying malaria and, and several other parasites. Uh, some of the money came from another um, uh, funding opportunity created by George W. Bush, who did have a serious concern for um, uh, America's potential to advance health in poor countries. Uh, and uh, his malaria research initiative was, is one of the sources that have been used for funding of research at the, at the MRTC. Uh, 
Things have gone badly in the last several years, though, and this illustrates one of the problems of trying to do research in countries that have an inherent political instability. And as I think everybody in this room probably knows, uh, Mali has been uh, uh, affected by the um, entry of, of terrorists, especially in the northern uh, regions of the country, which are very difficult to monitor. They have long stretches of, of uh, borders that, uh, to a variety of other countries, many of which have um, large terrorist um, uh, uh, centers, and uh, terrorism has led to the deaths of uh, Americans and Europeans and, and Malians over the last uh, several years. Uh, some control of the, of the insurgency efforts occurred uh, with the arrival of French troops in 2013, but still the country is unstable and, uh, uh, and many scientists are reluctant to visit for the, the, uh, the meetings and, and collaborations that had traditionally occurred there. Nevertheless, several NIH stalwarts have continued their uh, collaborative efforts with, uh, with the center in Mali. Um, uh, the, there's been um, some remarkable scientists, uh, such as this one, uh, Dejimdi, who um, now has joint appointments at the University of Cambridge and at the Malaria Research Center. Um, and uh, collaborations continue with uh, some of the um, malaria labs in the U.S., such as Chris Plows at the University of Baltimore. I want to say a few things about another effort to build a center in Africa, this one um, in Uganda. And the story begins um, a long time ago with the arrival of, a, of a, an Irish surgeon, Dennis Burkett, in, in Uganda at uh, the university in, um, in Kampala. Uh, and with his discovery of a, of a new disease, uh, now known as Burkitt's lymphoma, a lymphoma that, effect, that tends to occur in uh, young children, the age of usually between four and eight, uh, often manifest by the appearance of, of um, a lymphoma, a tumor of, of uh, white cells um, in the jaw and other facial regions of, of these children. Um, when samples from these lymphomas were sent to England to be evaluated by, uh, by a scientist named Tony Epstein, uh, he discovered a virus in these, uh, in these tumors called the Epstein virus, uh, which proves to be an extraordinarily important virus for all of us because it's widely disseminated in the U.S. and causes infectious mononucleosis. So here's an example of a, a, a virus important to all of us that was discovered because we, uh, an investment was made um, uh, by, um, by a U.K. scientist uh, doing um, clinical research in, in uh, Uganda. Um, at the time, um, the treatment center, Malago Hospital is the hospital affiliated with, with um, the university in Kampala. Uh, and uh, one of the remarkable things that happened uh, during um, Burkitt's lives there, uh, years there, was the development of uh, treatment that uh, uh, was remarkable at the time because uh, a single uh, chemotherapy, cytoxan, could be used to induce a rapid remission in patients, uh, and this over a course of just a week or two, uh, in patients who have this uh, devastating facial cancer. And uh, this uh, kind of response to uh, early stage chemotherapy uh, was recognized as uh, uh, an opportunity to try to understand more about how chemotherapy works and how it might be used in the U.S. Uh, by um, dignitaries and leaders from the uh, from the National Cancer Institute, Paul Carbone on the left was a, a major figure at the NCI at that time. Uh, John Ziegler, as a contemporary of mine at Amherst College, uh, was then a trainee at the, at the National Cancer Institute. And they came to Uganda uh, with an interest in making a deeper level of uh, collaboration with, uh, with the Ugandan scientists who were, and clinicians who were, who were uh, running the, uh, the hospital at Malago. Um, However, um, efforts to build the center, which um, were successful initially, were uh, imperiled by political instability. And over the course of about 20 years in Uganda, uh, this is uh, uh, Apollo Abote, who uh, was uh, uh, somewhat tyrannical, but uh, at least 
uh, occasionally reasonable uh, president for several years, but he was succeeded by Idi Amin, who's uh, famously uh, repressive and a dangerous person who made life intolerable for, uh, for NCI's representatives to uh, this, uh, this new, um, newly created uh, Cancer Research Institute. And indeed, uh, during this period, uh, John Siegler, who had been the director of the center, uh, was uh, um, ordered to leave the country. Uh, American involvement in the center became negligible, and the center depended very heavily for its survival on some distinguished Ugandan uh, clinical, clinical investigators and, uh, and Edward Mbibi, who was, who was a virologist, who kept the organization going uh, during some very bleak years uh, the, um, until um, 1985 when, when Museveni, who has his own difficulties but, and his own faults, but uh, is a, uh, fair, was fairly supportive of the center and uh, has um, instituted um, not just reasonable policies with respect to cancer research, but also with respect to control of HIV and AIDS. Um, became the president in 1985. During that period, um, following 1985 and the, the uh, advent of, of Museveni, uh, the, the center has uh, undergone a period of reconstruction um, that uh, has um, featured a, a lot of distinguished visitors. This is actually Sue Desmond Hellman, who was there for a while as an infectious disease fellow, um, uh, and uh, since then has been both the chancellor at UC San Francisco and now the CEO of the Gates Foundation um, um, and uh, uh, people who have been trained at the center have, have um, gone on to distinguished careers and one sees that uh, scientific exchange can occur in both directions because indeed um, uh, Sam Mopalaya is a, a scientist at the National Cancer Institute now after being uh, trained initially uh, in Uganda. Um, the center in Uganda has entered a modern era um, in which uh, its, its uh, uh, future has been closely tied to its relationship with the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center, a center which is uh, among the most important of the National Cancer Center's um, uh, um, designated cancer centers uh, nationwide. Um, and uh, the, this era has included um, creation of, of joint programs in which um, uh, Physicians from the Uganda Cancer Center go to Seattle for further training. Um, people from the Fred Hutchison Center go and, and uh, do research um, in Kampala. They have a, uh, a project house that, that encourages uh, uh, these um, uh, reciprocal travels. Um, the treatment facilities have been improved. Um, uh, distinguished uh, clinical scientists like Corey Casper spend a considerable time at the clinic. Um, uh, Lee Hartwell, who was the president when the, the reconstruction was in its heyday, uh, signed a con long-term contractual agreement with the Ugandan leader of the, of the institute, uh, shown here, Jackson Oram. Um, plans were made and then financed by USAID and the government of Uganda, as well as the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center, to build uh, a, a new center, which was uh, for which ground was broken uh, on a visit that I happened to take to Uganda in 2011. That building has now been built and occupied and uh, has uh, been successfully used in, in furthering the work that is being done uh, in, uh, in Kampala to, for, to study Burkitt's lymphoma and many other childhood cancers and, uh, um, and serve as a, as a site for sophisticated cancer care in Uganda. So, uh, by showing you something about these two centers, I wanted to illustrate some of the problems we face uh, in uh, trying to get centers going, dealing with political problems, with uh, the need for, uh, for having well-trained people who um, uh, also have shared high levels of, uh, of aspiration um, for uh, bringing sophisticated um, approaches to malaria or to non-infectious disease like cancer to a, to a poor country. I want to spend a couple of moments talking about a federal program for um, uh, setting um, uh, a series of ambitions for, um, for global health uh, that occurred during my stay at the National Cancer Institute over the last, uh, over the years from 2010 to 2015. Um, 
Uh, it's now widely recognized that uh, the global health concerns have to move away from infectious disease, diseases that have traditionally been uh, the, uh, the, the natural resting place for, for, uh, for global health activities, uh, diarrhea, um, tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria, and so forth. And uh, the, World, the World Health Organization and the UN generally have now had uh, multiple meetings on uh, how the global health uh, enterprise can be um, more fully directed toward uh, um, a variety of, of, um, of uh, non-infectious diseases, uh, including diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, uh, and cancers. Uh, and um, the need for this is demonstrated by this simple graph in which it is shown the, the projected uh, increases in the number of cancer deaths over the last, uh, the, predicted for 2030. Uh, and you can see that the, all the increases is occurring in low and middle income countries, uh, that uh, the number of deaths and, and uh, despite the growth of the population and the aging of the population, the number of deaths from cancer in our own countries is remaining, predicted to remain quite stable. Um, but uh, confronting this increased uh, death rate as lives become longer and fewer people die of infectious disease has created a, a, a serious need for, um, uh, for approaches to global health that are focused more intensely on, on uh, cancer. Um, to, so when I became head of NCI, we decided to build a center to address some of these problems. We convened a large meeting of people with experience in global health, people who were inherently interested in cancer in poor countries. Um, uh, everybody recognized that uh, we can't simply treat our way out of the problem. First of all, we couldn't afford it. And secondly, we don't really have the treatments available. And the, the general sense was that uh, we had to have a much more integrated approach that spells out a series of efforts that are reasonable uh, to uh, make whatever, is, whatever cancers we can prevent and can detect early and can treat efficiently uh, to be emphasized uh, with research um, at all of these levels, especially research that is locally appropriate, that is directed to the cancers that are most prevalent in different populations. So uh, in setting up the center, we had to recruit someone. We got a very uh, distinguished uh, uh, oncologist from within the NCI, Ted Trimble, to run this new unit. And we set up five goals. One is to figure out what is actually the problem, that is how common are cancers of different types to, uh, in different parts of the world. That meant developing registries, working with a variety of countries to develop national cancer plans, to try to look for low-hanging fruit, for example, cancers that can be uh, addressed by uh, the use of, um, of uh, anti-infectious um, uh, methods, uh, most obviously um, using vaccines, hepatitis B vaccine to uh, prevent infection by the hepatitis B virus, a known uh, causative agent of, of uh, hepatoma, uh, using uh, the human papillomavirus vaccine, which can protect against uh, cervical cancer, uh, a, a a very common cause of cancer mortality in women in poor countries, uh, and to think about uh, research that can be used, for example, to develop uh, ways to deal with infections like the Epstein-Barr virus, which is the cause of, of not just uh, the Burkitt's lymphoma that I showed you, but a form of, of nasopharyngeal cancer that exists especially in, in Southeast Asia. Um, there was a, a crying need that was articulated at, the, at our original planning meeting to think about ways to use what's often called implementation science, uh, operationally based science to improve the way uh, cancer is screened, cancers, uh, cancer patients uh, are offered access to treatment, uh, and the way in which we carry out surgery and radiotherapy in, even in countries that are impoverished. And then to think about other kinds of uh, of uh, measures that are used to prevent disease uh, of other kinds, for example, uh, control of d obesity, decreasing the use of alcohol, um, and importantly, perhaps most importantly, control of, of tobacco use, which has a multifactorial outcome because it's also a way to prevent cardiovascular and lung disease, not just uh, cancer. 
Uh, and then finally, there's an, an effort that we mounted to try to um, harness student enthusiasm for global health uh, to find uh, uh, partner institutions such as cancer centers like the Fred Hutchison Center to help uh, with uh, the creation of, uh, of new centers in countries that had not been benefiting from global health efforts and to try to build capacity in these countries. Just to give you one idea of what this means, uh, focus, it's really important at the outset of this kind of effort to understand what the problem is in each country that's being, um, being uh, 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 considered as a, as a partner in this effort. You, have to, you can't study what you haven't counted, and you can't count unless you have um, ways for people to get appropriate samples and interpret uh, 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 a diagnosis of cancer by uh, having um, a well-trained pathologists example, uh, examine the samples. Uh, and this is a very important theme that was used in our efforts uh, and ongoing efforts at the, at the Global Health Center to work with countries like Mexico, India, China, Turkey, Indonesia, and others to develop, help them develop uh, national cancer plans. Um, this is a, simply a diagram that shows that, that the incidence of the mortality, uh, the incidence of, of several common forms of cancer, um, stomach cancer on the left, uh, cervical cancer on the right, um, lung cancer down below, vary dramatically um, among countries for a variety of reasons having to do with smoking incidence and sexual practices and, and availability of certain <laughs> kinds of, uh, of preventive and therapeutic strategies. Uh, and these are in important facts in trying to develop any, uh, any strategy um, to combat cancer in, in poor countries. Um, we have been successful in, in encouraging uh, center, uh, universities to, uh, to build cancer centers uh, in Africa and now other places. Uh, you offer supplements to support um, such activities through National Cancer Center um, uh, grants that uh, uh, can be um, added to by uh, providing um, additional funds in response to proposals to, to help build centers and, and to use centers that have been built to do collaborative research projects. And all this has been happening over the last several years, slowly but, uh, but, but, but surely. Um, now, doing all these things in the current political situation that we're in, I think, has to be at least mentioned in this, in, in, at this uh, talk. Um, we know that we have uh, a president who, uh, whose um, um, in instinct is not necessarily uh, altruistic, uh, and uh, the, just the cry of America first is one that uh, places uh, uh, global health efforts at, a, at risk. Um, and uh, this litany of uh, items that have concerned all of us in science uh, is a series of concerns that, uh, um, that we may be um, finding that efforts to promote global health by some of the methods that I've mentioned uh, may be imperiled. So um, I don't have an answer to this question, um, but I think I, I can't talk about uh, what has been done in the past and what might be done in the future without recognizing that, uh, that um, having an executive branch of the US government that doesn't seem particularly supportive of either science or, in, or foreign aid is something that uh, all of us who think that these measures are the right ones to take have to take into consideration. Uh, so far, the damage has been minimal, but I think uh, uh, over the next several years, we have to be careful about uh, how, how we plan to sustain these efforts. One way to do that is to engage with other potential um, uh, donors in collaborative relationships. And we tried to do that uh, even in the prior administration by reaching out to um, a number of European and, and uh, uh, Asian organizations that are interested in promoting better cancer research and cancer care in poor countries. Um, uh, Harpal Kumar, who was then the head of the Cancer Research UK, and I convened a series of meetings uh, in France, uh, England, and the US of leaders of a variety of, of um, cancer research organizations and cancer care organizations to try to uh, discuss the opportunities for advancing some of the items that were on the, 
the agenda for the, for the National Cancer Institute's uh, new Center for Global Health. And uh, these recommendations, I think, are still viable. The idea of working together with other countries to try to, uh, to um, minimize the effect of uh, our own country's uh, reluctance to promote international um, uh, cooperation may be one way to, uh, to try to cope with this current dilemma. So I'd like to say just a couple of words now. I know I'm getting into, uh, getting close to the time at which I should be shutting up and asking for questions, and I will do that in a minute. But I want to say a couple of words about another important problem that is not necessarily um, directed toward uh, specific projects that advance cancer research in specific countries, but instead uh, have are concerned with the general in infrastructure for science, the way in which we as scientists relate to each other, um, transfer our findings from, from one mind to another, and that has to do with how we, how we um, uh, practice what is in some ways the most important thing we do, and that is to share our findings with other scientists. Um, there is a paradox here. The U.S. developed the most powerful tool ever for, for sharing work. Um, Gutenberg did a great thing uh, for transmission of scientific information in the, in the 15th century with, with, uh, uh, with the printing press, but uh, even more powerful is the internet and its capacity to allow information exchange throughout the world instantaneously. Uh, but at least uh, <coughs> biological scientists in this country have been very slow to take full advantage of the internet as a way to, to move information around and allow countries that, that can't receive traditional paper, journals on paper to participate in this uh, in the rapidly moving field of science. Um, and for historians of art, uh, this is, uh, in my, way, my view, way of thinking, uh, a powerful way to evoke uh, the transmission of information um, from uh, a knowledgeable physician to, in this case, uh, uh, just interested businessmen from other, other towns in Holland who want to know uh, the parts of the body. And uh, that's a, 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 a motivation that uh, we, we need to sustain in science. Uh, and um, this is emblematic of uh, the desire that many of us have. And the obvious uh, implication of sharing is that uh, the countries uh, that are off the, nearly off the grid with respect to traditional subscription-based uh, paper journals suddenly uh, have uh, the same instantaneous access that anybody else would have. This article published uh, almost 20 years ago in the New York Times um, suggests what the implications might be for people trying to do science in countries like Zimbabwe. Now, um, this involves a change in our culture, uh, and uh, uh, there are three ways in which this is happening. I'm going to mention each one of them very, very briefly. Uh, one is to allow uh, information to be disseminated by creating public digital libraries that uh, allow uh, anyone to have access to the most sophisticated information that science can produce. Uh, second is to change the way we publish by um, publishing in a, with a different business model so that uh, we don't need to um, be subscribers to journals. Instead, the, the, uh, the onus of supporting publication practices falls on the scientists and their funders, not on the readers. And finally, by improving access even uh, more dramatically by uh, encouraging scientists to be sharing their data and their papers before, before review, uh, through, um, through internet servers. So just a few things about each of them. Um, uh, the, the goal that the NIH espoused uh, late in my tenure as NIH director in the late 90s was to um, make um, not just the names of papers, the names of authors, and the abstract available, but instead, um, because the internet does not, uh, it does not present any barriers to doing this, uh, to make uh, complete scientific articles and even books available uh, to the public, especially when we're talking about describing work that is supported with public funding. Um, now, this met with a lot of objections that I don't have time to review, but uh, journals that were making huge profits were not happy about the idea that they might end up losing uh, revenue from subscriptions um, as a result of these changes. Um, I, because these 
library proposals were built it built with a um, a, uh, um, uh, a delay before the the work was going to be uh, given to the public. Uh, these concerns were exaggerated, but nevertheless, they were very influential in slowing uptake. And the outcome was that while we founded the, uh, the, the, the concept of having a full text digital library in, the, in 1999, uh, the uptake was quite slow. That is, journals were very reluctant to give, give up on their, their um, uh, hold on copyright of the papers they published. Uh, and to put uh, the papers into, um, into PubMed Central until 2007 when Congress actually mandated that uh, all work supported by the NIH be placed in public libraries within a year of publication. Um, copyright was not necessarily uh, given over by the journals, but nevertheless, the papers now appear. And uh, today, virtually every scientist I know in the biomedical world uses PubMed Central on a daily basis because over 80% of uh, work that has uh, any NIH support uh, is placed in this library. So the benefit has been high and uh, uh, it's been a remarkable transition from the, the very um, restricted world in which we all worked before. Uh, the second development is the change in publishing practice, and it's really a change in the business model for science journals so that uh, expenses are no longer covered by subscriptions, but instead by authors' fees that are, that are actually paid with the money provided by the funders of the research project. In general, the cost of publication is about 1 to 2 percent at most of the cost of doing the project, and of course the project not, is not valuable if it's not accessible to, to readers who want to find out what the study showed. Um, and uh, there are additional benefits, including free global access for people trying to do science in poor countries uh, and remarkable savings for university libraries. Uh, there have been objections, of course, from the publishers who make big profits and uh, are uh, concerned about uh, getting less money to cover their costs than they would um, under a subscription-based business model. Um, and there was concern that, that journals would now be motivated to accept articles because uh, that's the way they would make their money. Um, and uh, I don't think this has come to pass. What has come to pass is the creation of many open access journals, uh, one that I founded with two colleagues uh, about 15 years ago. The Public Library of Science has become a particularly prominent publisher of open access journals, but there are many others now as well. And, Open access articles are also found in conventional journals. Today, we estimate that roughly 30 percent of, uh, of work published in our fields uh, is in an open access format so that they are immediately available uh, through PubMed Central and through the websites operated by these journals. And this is simply a, a brief summary of the difference between a world dominated by for-profit <coughs> publishers like Elsevier uh, and, as opposed to open access publishers. And, uh, the benefits to the scientific community, I think, are dramatically, uh, um, out, um, dramatically greater uh, in, in the open access mode. Uh, and the final development is the online posting of preprints, uh, an idea which has been um, widely adopted in, by physicists and computer scientists and astrophysicists for over 25 years, but just now becoming, um, becoming common in biology. Uh, the idea here is to allow findings to be posted in a fashion that clearly indicates that they have not been peer-reviewed, but that allows constructive criticism before uh, formal review and publication in a traditional journal. Uh, it also allows uh, scientists to establish priority of discovery uh, at a, an appropriate time, uh, not impeded by the often laborious and time-consuming uh, review process that uh, now uh, is um, of common practice at many outstanding journals. Um, there are a lot of, uh, I think, false objections here. I'm not going to go through them. Um, this time is getting short. Um, but all of these uh, issues that some of my colleagues have raised, I think, are uh, specious and refutable. Um, finally, the fact is that uh, although it's early days, uh, the use of, uh, of preprint servers for rapid distribution of work even before it's been peer-reviewed, 
uh, has grown dramatically. And one such server called BioArchive um, uh, that's been managed by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories has had a dramatic increase, over a 10 to 20-fold increase in the number of posted articles. Uh, and those of us who use it um, look at some satisfaction with at the appearance of articles that uh, otherwise might take many months or a couple of years to get published are available to our scientific colleagues in full text form um, uh, at the time that the papers are submitted for publication or even before. So let me just summarize briefly what I've had to say as in fairly sim two simple points. One is that uh, uh, I've tried to advance my view that doing international research is a public good, uh, that it fosters health and that it warrants support. Um, but it's also a daunting task and that there are a lot of things involved in trying to get it to work. And I, by talking about some important research centers in African countries and talking about how we uh, tried to put together a center for global health at the NCI, I've tried to illustrate that uh, a lot of things are engaged, uh, uh, involved in this process, uh, ranging from uh, commitments that have to be made by by the governments involved, um, uh, attitudes uh, toward uh, helping others on this planet, um, the tools of diplomacy, the use of, of uh, sometimes scarce funds, the need to, to plan carefully and engage others in collaborative activities and train talented people uh, and uh, develop enlightened systems for the conduct and communication of science. I appreciate the chance to talk to you about these issues, which have uh, been um, important to me over the last couple of decades, and I welcome a chance to answer some of your questions in the moments that remain. Thank you very much. I'm sure you could do this yourself. Well, I could, but you know, nope. you do things so well, yeah. <laughs> and with such authority here at Princeton. <laughs> up in central New Jersey, I have an interest in global health. Uh, which countries would you say are at the forefront of international um, biomedical research and also in the publications, in the modernization of sharing publications? Yeah, are well, there good models elsewhere beyond the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think we have uh, uh, pioneered these new initiatives and publication practices, but they're being adopted quite widely. Um, nevertheless, there are countries, and sometimes they are uh, the disadvantaged countries, that are placing an undue emphasis on publication in highly prestigious journals and not paying much attention to uh, the, the way in which information is transmitted. So, a uh, scientist in Pakistan, for example, who publishes in Nature will be rewarded with a cash bonus and a promotion. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't help the situation very much. Is endowment an, a feasible as Is what? endowment for any of these um, repositories? Well, the NIH is supporting PubMed Central. They're paying full freight. It's not terribly expensive to, to put these articles into digital form. They come in digital form. They're converted very cheaply and efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can tell from talking to David Littman, who until recently was the, not, he's, he'll always be the originator of the, of the methodology here, but uh, he was until recently the manager of the, of the system. And he says there's been no difficulty in coping with the flow. The big thing was to get everybody um, uh, directed toward providing their content, their, their published papers to, to PubMed Central. And once Congress made it imperative, and the NIH came along behind them and said, you know, you're not going to get your grant if you don't post your paper, uh, then the funders have a major role here. The, you know, the, the scientific societies have been um, variable with respect to the promotion of these methods. You would think, as, so, as societies representing scientists, they would want to promote rapid transfer of information. But the societies have their own foot, uh, their, their own um, uh, hand in the game because they run journals which are very lucrative and you know, support the good work of the societies, but it's an antiquated way to, 
to support the way the, science, the, way the scientific societies do their good work. Um, funders have realized that, that publishing in open access journals is good, and they will pay the, the full freight for doing that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they have supported preprints very actively, and uh, indeed, um, NIH and other funding organizations have made uh, a commitment that, uh, first of all, you can cite a preprint in a grant application. Um, sometimes they, they mandate the posting of preprints, uh, and they recognize that, that their job is to get research done and get the findings used by others. And the idea of sharing information and and hastening communication of scientific results is very much in their own interest. And therefore, um, many are saying uh, that uh, it's very important to have these tools available for scientists to use them. A new funder in this game is Chan Zuckerberg, and maybe this is a good week in which to give Mark Zuckerberg a little bit of praise. Um, full disclosure, I'm on their advisory board. Um, but, but, uh, but, uh, um, the, the Jan Zuckerberg effort is strongly supportive. In fact, they are a major funder of, uh, of the BioArchive repository and preprint server at Cold Spring Harbor. And they require that, that everybody who receives money from, from the science initiative at Jan Zuckerberg be, um, uh, use the, the preprint servers mm -hmm. and to work out faster. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, China is taking a lot of interest in Africa from an economic point of view. I'm not sure about the societal aspects. I'm wondering if you're participating in that. Well, thank you for um, bringing this up because uh, I think part of the first part of your question was about who was doing making big investments in science. And you can't ignore the fact that, that in China, the rate of in, increased investment in science is creating is certainly outpacing the US, even with the, the successful budget season we've just gone through. It took a long time. That we've gotten our money in the U.S. halfway through the fiscal year, but the increase in, in spending, DOE, NIH, even a small amount of the NSF, um, all these things are very much to our advantage. But China is accelerating its spending on science dramatically. Uh, as you point out, they're deeply invested in trying to uh, be good partners to African countries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about how much of that is, uh, is directed toward the conduct of science itself. They certainly are doing a lot of construction projects and educational projects. Um, uh, the question that is frequently on the minds of many of us is how, how deep is the, the, the challenge posed by biomedical science in China to what is going on in Europe and the US? And I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. I, most of us would say that most of, this, of the scientific findings that we follow and um, respect and, and react to are still coming from American and European labs. But there are a lot of excellent people who have left the US to go back to very tempt to accept very tempting offers from, from China to do research there. And I, this is going to be a very productive enterprise in the long run. I don't think it's quite gotten there yet, but, uh, but um, money and talent Produce results eventually, and that's going to happen. Yeah. How do you solve the peer review process and the <laughs> quality of science? Well, I think we've got to be. You're talking about peer review in grants, for journals, for yeah. for journals. Yeah. Okay. So the, this is a, a very important question. Huh? Um, one of the things that the, uh, many of, that I and many of my colleagues are attracted to is the idea that, that, uh, that review should occur after the paper is made public. That it's moved from peer review before publication to peer review before traditional publication to uh, peer review that, that, that follows the presentation of work on a, on a server. Um, I don't see any reason why that's a bad idea. You can do you can change the paper after it's been posted. Uh, you can clearly indicate the, the stage at which the paper is presented. Um, there is a, an organization called Faculty of a Thousand. Again, I have to disclose I'm on the advisory board there, but not necessarily uh, I'm convinced that all their, all their moves are correct. But I think one thing they identified is a, 
is a way to proceed that is quite attractive. The idea is that they provide a platform for someone to put their work in the public domain. Cost a little money, but not an extraordinary amount. And then the paper is assigned reviewers who post their reviews, so you see them. They're not signed, but they're seen. Um, the authors of the paper can go back and, and comment um, on, on the reviews, um, change the paper, write version two. Um, eventually, um, when a paper has been um, uh, viewed as acceptable by two or more of the reviewers, um, it gets listed in some inventory of, of work that is now officially published. Um, but it changes the, the peer review process because, first of all, it's open, not it's secret. Uh, the peer review process does not slow the, the distribution of work. Um, the process can be used to create a hierarchy of importance of work. I believe strongly that we have to, that we can't just put everything up there because there's too much to look at. So you've got to have some way to vet it. Newspapers solve that problem. They have a front page, they have a classified, they have things in between. Uh, and I think um, on, online journals or online publication platforms can eventually do the same kind of thing when you see papers. We, we have metrics already posted on papers that have been published by certain journals. So you see how often, how many people have looked at it, how many people have downloaded it, how many people have commented one way or the other. Um, we can develop some kind of uh, rating system that won't be laborious for people who have re read the paper. And we can begin to develop by fields uh, a listing of, uh, of papers that just appeared that uh, have attracted special levels of interest. Um, I think this problem can be solved. I think we can't let, and one of the things that I have not mentioned about all this that is particularly concerning to Shirley and me and other of our colleagues who work in an organization called Rescuing Biomedical Research, and that is the overvaluing of the place where you publish your work. And we've got to uncouple ourselves from that because at all institutions, I don't, I'd be surprised if Princeton is an exception, there is an imperative to publish some of your work in what are called the high impact journals. And this is an awful thing because one of the principles of, of uh, collaborative scholarship that should exist at these institutions is a willingness of, of, uh, of members of those institutions to take the work of their colleagues seriously, which means reading it and developing an opinion about it, not depending on editors at journals to make decisions about what gets published. Um, if we don't do that, I think we're in deep difficulty. But we, we live in a world that's highly competitive. There are not enough jobs. There are not enough uh, slots in prestigious journals. There are not enough grants. And people are using a false value system for making judgments about the quality of people's work. And I, we've got to find ways to revert to a, a system that uh, engages everybody in a community-wide effort to be evaluators of each other. We can't depend solely on a few journal editors to say who is valuable and who's not. Look like you want to come back and come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a question. Oh. So you outlined some really interesting kind of bilateral or multi-country projects. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the role of the WHO and what works in a multilateral context and what types of projects yeah. are. I'm probably not the best person to do that. I just have not had that much engagement. I've worked on their commission on macroeconomics and health. Um, I, we, we took a stance in our report to the IOM a few years ago about WHO. Law don't like the WHO, they say it's too bureaucratic and it doesn't serve the public, the, the common interest. I look at it somewhat differently. First of all, it doesn't have enough money. The support is very poor from, was poor from the US and poor, poor from a lot of other countries. It needs more resources. I mean, secondly, if we didn't have it, if we abolished the WHO, we would recreate it because you've got to have some governing body to turn to uh, when there's a, an international epidemic or uh, some other health crisis. So uh, we do need some oversight body. You can't depend on an organization that's so poorly funded to do the research. What you're looking for is 
implementation of uh, public health practices that uh, have um, international significance because uh, they, um, um, they affect people in many different countries, and you can't expect a single national uh, health uh, system to be able to address it. Um, so you've got to have some international body. You can't simply depend on the United Nations. You've got to have a, a subsidiary organization, like the WHO. Um, but you know, it's not able to, to mount uh, responses that uh, are as effective as we'd all like. I think the reasonable job, by the way, in, in, in the last several years with the, the Ebola outbreak and a few others, actually, they, they moved pretty quickly. But they have been criticized in the past. And having been on the payroll very briefly during the, the creation of that commission report, I know uh, how, how uh, difficult uh, a situation they're in from a budgetary point of view. And, and they're just limited in a way in the speed and effectiveness in which they can respond. Yeah. So you, you very nicely outlined your, your journey, your experience, the examples, the global health initiatives, and then in your last slide, the factors that are necessary to continue the initiatives. The one area that you didn't touch on, but I'm sure you've thought a lot about, is creating incentives. You know, what, what are the mechanisms to create the incentives, especially within those developing countries, mm -hmm. to make this more of a self-sustaining initiative? Yeah, I probably should have said a little bit more about that, but um, you know, I agree that some of these things you can't just depend on altruism. You have to outline why you why you need to uh, to improve health in, in, in poor countries. And I, I think um, that's one that was one of the jobs of the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health to point out that that uh, that there are tremendous economic incentives to improve health in these countries that. A, you decrease spending on health, which in some of these countries is not very high just because they don't have the money to spend on health, but the willingness of, uh, of major industries to create plants in, the, in those countries, to do trading in those countries, is, is often dependent on how, how secure the health situation is there. Uh, people don't want to send their employees to countries that are ravaged by infectious disease. Um, people want to have a workforce if they if they are engaged in, in, um, in business development with a, with a poor country. They want to have reasonable assurance that, that, uh, that health standards are high and that, that, uh, that people are um, healthy enough to, to do a, a full day's good work. So I, just as there are incentives for creating um, uh, improvements in education to have a, a smarter, better, better educated health uh, workforce, I think there are incentives to have uh, a healthy workforce to improve economic well-being. But there, you know, there, the other things tend to be multinational and perhaps don't address a national interest so clearly, but, uh, in, but uh, you know, there are other incentives having to do with environmental protection, maybe not espoused as avidly by, by all countries as they are by others. Yeah. Going back to the previous question where you asked whether peer review of journals or grants. Mm -hmm. So going to the grant side of things and maybe beyond that, and it's probably too short of time to go through the full thing, but the, the current, uh, until the current funding of the NIH, funding available for new investigators to really come into the industry as research mm -hmm. scientists has been very difficult. Right. The, the uh, pay lines keep on going lower and lower and lower and the peer review system uh, well, I'm just curious, your view of the peer review system, is there <laughs> ideas there to, to make them better and really help young right. investigators? <laughs> We're just talking about this problem. Uh, first of all, I mean, let me just say, I don't think that the recent increase is going to change the yeah. success rate all that much. It's, but it's, a, it's, it's good. It's better. It's the right direction. Yeah, but you know, we're not going to fix peer review by having more no. money. No. Uh, and I think we want to separate those two issues. Uh, NIH has been underfunded for the last decade or so. Yes. Uh, and we need to do something about improving our support for the, for the agency. It's something else to say, how do you fix peer review? Um, it's never going to be perfect, but there are things we can do to make it better. Um, and uh, one of the things I've always found um, uh, disturbing is the, 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 the uh, fact that, that most peer review committees have very few senior scientists on them. 
And one way to, you know, having seasoned people who um, have been through it before uh, and who contribute to the decision-making process in a measured way with a lot of experience behind them is very, very valuable. And I think the way to make this more attractive to senior participants is to um, make service on the study section a more enjoyable experience. And that may mean serving not three or four times a year, but once a year. It may mean changing the requirements for the, the way um, reviews are done. I mean, many of us have, who um, they have traditionally served, a long time ago served on NI study sections, have done review in other venues where the process is much less labored and uh, comes to the point, which is who gets funded and who doesn't, with uh, um, a much simpler process. And you know, unfortunately, government gives out money in ways that have to be very careful because it's public money. And uh, I don't so all to be high, higher quality reviewers. High quality reviewers right. help, but it's not the only thing. I think the, the process can be made um, a more enjoyable one and to encourage uh, more senior people who've served their time as junior scientists to go back and do it again and to the leaven of the, uh, the, the group with, uh, with more experience. And that helps. It's not a solution to the problem. There are other things that are more technical in nature that bother me. We were talking earlier about the large number of ad hoc reviewers who come in for a single session and, and uh, have not had much experience in giving voting privileges. They're not, these are, may seem like trivial things, but they affect the way uh, the, the process works. And uh, Having grants where a single reviewer knocks it out and makes it very yeah. troubling. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds like there's some bad experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Last question. Okay. Yeah, in the back. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on um, publicly available information for your publication on biohazardous scientific information? So research that is being done sure. that could no, potentially be dual use virus. research of concern. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've re recently written down my my opinions about this, I don't know, a report that we just that was just issued from the uh, National Research Council about a year ago. Um, and the bottom line here is, that, in my view, is that uh, we need to teach students, graduate students, at a much earlier stage about the potential for dual use research. Most people don't even know it's an issue. Um, the idea is that some, so, some research is not classified, but has some potential for uh, being used in, a, in an untoward way, a, a, a way that might pose a, a threat to public safety. Um, I think those, the number of instances in which that's true is very, very small, but nevertheless, I think everybody who does science ought to recognize that there is the potential for harm in some of the work that some people do, and we ought to be alert to it. And the traditional way of thinking about this is to say, we're not going to publish that work. And that the that the journals are going to shut it down at, at the point of publication. That's the wrong approach. First of all, as the last part of my talk today would remind you, um, work gets out before peer review. It gets out on, in a variety of ways. People give talks. Uh, newspapers write articles. You can't control information once the information has been obtained. And what you want to do is get people to think about the implications of the work they're doing at much earlier stages. Now, I frankly have difficulty in envisioning a whole lot of experiments that, that are done in my range of things, genetics and cell biology, cancer biology, that would be threats to the public. But you know, there was a case several years ago um, in which uh, people were trying to understand the factors, genetic factors that make influenza virus more virulent. And the, the two papers in question were ultimately published, but there was a lot of debate about the topic. I don't think we actually absorbed that debate in a way that allows us to say um, we ought to do a better job in teaching people at an early stage of their career about the fact that such things might happen and they ought to think about it. Most people don't think about it. Please, everybody, join me in thanking you.